Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be doing Planar Compass, uh, the issues that they've come out with so far, which is 1, 2, and 3. This is for old school essentials, and essentially it's like a Spelljammer uh, zine that's releasing various parts of the this sort of OSE version of the Spelljammer setting. Essentially, it's you're up in the Astral Sea, sailing ships around, there are pirates, there's islands, different planes of existence, astral storms, lots of really bizarre things to run into and to deal with, and it's really cool. The stuff they've released so far, I think, is really, really awesome. I'm not sure I'm ever going to run this, because Spelljammer isn't really my, my jam. <laughs> no pun intended, honestly. But it's just kind of a really cool, like, I don't know, source of ideas, I would say, all three of them. And I like the art, and some of the rule systems are cool. And if you're into Spelljammer, or you think that you might be willing to give it a look, or give it a try, then, you know, I think this will be a video for you, just to give a, you know, a brief overview of these books and what they're like. The first issue came out in the summer of 2020, and it's uh, pretty... Well, I'll say this, it's my least favorite of the three. Not because it's bad at all, at all, but I think the other two are much more interesting and robust. This is the shortest by about 12 pages. Um, it's only 60 pages, but it's a good, solid introduction to the setting. You get basically an island with stuff going on there and some adventures that are happening there, a dungeon there, and as well as some additional classes and rules for psionics. Um, the island is called Dream Haven, and essentially it's this giant hand that's floating in space. Now, uh, there is a secret about this giant hand that uh, you should... Um, not look into if you're a player, if you're planning on playing through the Planar Compass adventures or this sort of world. But if you're a DM, it's really interesting. I kind of like it. But it's also one of those secrets that the author says, feel free to ignore this <laughs> because it kind of does change things dramatically. You can use this either as a one shot or as a campaign starter, very obviously. And you can also use it as sort of a campaign break because this is a place where it's a port. There's some interesting stuff happening there, but you kind of have to stay on the port for a while in order for it to be, uh, for a lot of that stuff to come out. So, you know, one of the one of the hooks here is that you come to the port, uh, you know, poor, maybe you barely make it to this place and you have to pay a very high fee to get off and you can't get your ship out basically until you've made enough money to, to get it off the island. It has a brief introduction to the setting, which is the Astral Sea and the islands which are floating in it. This version of the Astral Sea is really cool. Essentially, there's this like liquid, uh, this water, translucent, translucent dark and blue, dark blue and purple waves that give way to nebula and stars. So you're looking down through the water at nebula and stars, and you're looking up at nebula and stars. You're sailing, literally sailing, in giant sailing ships with sails, <laughs> um, through this sea. And then depending on kind of what part of the sea you're in, you can look through it and see the different planes below, or kind of like a version of the plane below. Now you can't just like dive down and get to them as far as I can tell, but there are portals on different islands that you can find that lead you to the different planes of existence. So that's really cool. And I think as these issues come out, they're going to detail various planes of existence. That's what the third one is. The third issue is the detailing of one of the planes and sort of the island of how to get there and stuff like that. So here's the island of Dreamhaven. It's a safe harbor from the storms of the Astral Sea. And you get the background of the island. Paleo One-Eye, who's a pirate, who basically crash-landed here and had a bunch of mead. <laughs> and then a bunch of other sailors showed up and he started charging them for the mead and essentially set up a, a tavern here and the, the, the settlement built up around that. You get species of note that are in the Astral Sea. And you get a few special... You always get humans, of course. They make a note. <laughs> I like he says, they just seem to make their way into... They just seem to make their way everywhere. There are two writers, I think, for this. Uh, I'm not sure who did most of the, the writing for these sections, but there are two writers for the majority of the book, as far as I can tell. But you get different kinds of species. You get humans, you get chanicoids, which are sort of clockwork beings. You get the skulga, which are skinny goblins with heads that look like deer skulls. You get the belsorisos, which are essentially rocket raccoon. <laughs> They're furry humanoids who resemble raccoons. Um, and you get the adhelsi, and then you get the onauk, Onauk, I don't know how to say that, but they're sort of like tieflings, sort of. And then the Ed Helsi are well, fey creatures with psionic powers. Um, essentially, this draws heavy inspiration from the like, Guardians of the Galaxy, obviously, but also just generally from the Planescape setting, or I shouldn't say the Planescape setting, the uh, Spelljammer setting. There is a, a way to keep perfect time throughout the entirety of this system. It uses the time of Ordo, which is the plane of law. So that's the time that everyone uses. 
And then the, uh, now it's interesting, the island is always sort of in this twilight, and that's sort of true for the entire astral sea. There's no day or night cycle. Um, so it's always the same there. But you use this um, time of Ord and clocks that are made by the clockmakers of Ordo, basically to, to keep track of time as you go through the entirety of the Astral Sea. So basically, the, most of this book is descriptions of the island itself and the different people and ships that are here, as well as adventure hooks and uh, just various uh, potential adventures that are running through the region. It's a pretty cool place. It's pretty straightforward. Like, it's standard piratey themed, uh, you know, like a port town in any sort of piratey campaign. You get Grog. You get different merchant ships, you get different pirates who are hiding out here, and different adventurers who are kind of just cast ashore here or kind of just ended up here. But there's also kind of a secret, because there is a dungeon beneath this place. And what's going on there is kind of tied into the whole place itself and why it exists in the first place. And you get a bunch of adventures that are set here. Uh, you get Pantry Raid, which is that, you know, you have to go and try to find out why the... Uh, the uh, pantry in the tavern is constantly running out, constantly running empty, and why the warehouse is losing its stuff. Uh, then you get uh, the bottle, ta you get bottle tables, random bottles, and what's inside those random bottles. I like number five here. The phantom ship. When opened, a hazy plume will steal out of the bottle and form an ethereal ship. If the players are caught in the path of the apparition, they are whisked out to sea at uh, out to sea a distance before the specter dissipates, stand it, stranding those aboard. It's kind of interesting. Um, then you get, uh, let's see, beach zombies, psyombies. They're kind of a psionic zombie thing that's out there. You got a three-hour tour. <laughs> you go and help this guy fish and psionic zombies attack the boat. And you can find the lost trident of Benjamin's crew. All that glitters, another adventure here. Um, and then Deep Warren, which is the uh, one of these other adventures, and the actual dungeon itself, and how you might go into Deep Warren, which is, as you can see, sort of laid out like a hand. And that plays into the, the, the reason for the dungeon in the first place. It's a really cool dungeon. I like how it is laid out. Yeah, you have these sort of like, you know, points that end that particular branch, but it all is connected with this large hallway, and so it's it's pretty inter it's a pretty interconnected dungeon. It's pretty cool. And what's going on in here is it's straightforward. It's not an incredibly awesome dungeon with really cool things going on, but it's I would say it's a certainly it's a solid dungeon. B plus A minus sort of dungeon. Or maybe B B plus is a dungeon. And it's really cool. Like there's it's a good introduction to this sort of setting. But there's one really cool thing in it, I think, which is the the portal to Hedgemasia which is essentially uh, a different portal plane of existence, and you can walk through the... Well, I'm not sure if you can walk through the, the, the mirror, but you can certainly travel into the hedge maze, which is forming in this world as a result of the portal. So the portal sort of warping the world around it to make it more like what you see on the other side. And there's stuff you can run into, Nixies and Pixies and Sprites. Uh, there's a clockwork guard here who's really cool. He's got four arms, looks like uh, General Grievous or whatever from Star Wars. And then you have the uh, Merchant's Vault, the Deluxe Vault. And, and a potential celestial who can return to the island. And you can see based on how small these ships are, how big he is. Massive. But the, I love this piece of art because it gives you a sense of what sailing on the Astral Sea looks like. It looks like you're sailing on the ocean, but you kind of get this sense of depth. And it goes, goes, goes. And then, of course, these planets and nebulae above and things like that. Really cool image. You get the classes, because this is for old school essentials. And so you have race as classes and then a couple extra things here. You have the Adhelsi which are the uh, fey creatures. This is what they look like, sort of alien fey. It's kind of cool. They have psionic powers. And this book has a whole set of rules for psionic powers. Uh, there's an astral sailor, swashbuckler, with the uh, regular level projection for it. Onauks, which are kind of like berserkers, and these uh, fiends, sort of like tieflings, basically, tieflings. And then scions, which are non-fey, you know, humanoid, uh, human psionics. And then how do you use the psionic powers? Power and energy. Now, if you're not familiar with, it's a very different sort of system than just standard magic. You have like points that you have to use up. You have different powers you can get. You can choose how hard you're, you know, how, uh, basically how much to use or how, uh, when to use them, like spells in that way. But you have to maintain them or defend against them. You can test psionics. If you, if you have another psionicist in the, in the enemy group, it becomes sort of a mini game as you're trying to beat the enemy psionicist. And if there isn't a psionicist, you have a major advantage against the enemy. 
Here are the different kinds of psionics that you can deal with, different attack modes and different defense modes and how they work against each other. I remember one time I played a game in Dark Sun when I was a lot younger, and I played a Thrykreen psionicist. And uh, it was totally a new experience. This whole rule, the, the psionic rules were totally new for me. I'd never played them before, but I thought they were so awesome. It was like a second game going on while everyone was playing regular D&D around me. Uh, I think some players would really like to play psionicists, but it does tend to bog things down, and it's a new system if you're not familiar with it at all. Here's a list of all the different powers you can have over and above those main attacks. And they're kind of like spells and what they can do, but they all depend upon costs of psionic points and how you maintain them and, and all of that. You can cast them, then you have to maintain them with a different maintenance cost and things like that. But they're really cool and really powerful. Lots and lots of psionic powers. I would say this is these rules make me want to add psionics into a game that I play. I'm not sure, again, I would play this particular setting, but they're, they're uh, flexible enough. Or I shouldn't say flexible, but you could just take these out and put them back in in any other game. <laughs> At the end, there's an open gaming license and then the final cover. So this is 60 pages, introductory, you get that setting, and you get psionics rules, class rules, and some extra races and things like that, race as class and all that. It's a cool introductory book, and it gets you right in. You could just take this book and play an adventure and get a sense for at least the world that you're in. You, you aren't doing a lot of sailing in this book. You're not actually going around the Astral Sea with this one book. For that, you have to get the second one. The second one is Buccaneers of the Big Black, which is from autumn of 2021. Now, another thing I should say, by the way, is that the art in these books is all very consistent and it's all great. I think especially this book, number two, I really like the art for. This, in my, per, from my perspective, is a much better book than the first one. It's bigger, it's 72 pages, and you get, it just it opens things up, it's broader. You get the multiverse with the planes and descriptions of those planes, the inhabitants, known portals, and the distance from Dreamhaven, which is that island. So if you make Dreamhaven more of a hub, then you can kind of keep coming back to it and use it as a base of operation to travel around the Astral Sea, which would be cool. Um, then you get the actual introduction itself. Um, a great book. You get the multiverse in brief, introductions, monsters, the career, pirates, astral ships, magic items, hex flowers, which is a special way that this game does sort of traveling and encounters and stuff. It's a cool system. I'm not sure how much better it is than a standard system but it's pretty interesting. But you get a few other things like this. You get an introduction, welcome back, and the book's required to play it. Now, these are very obviously meant to be, you know, two-page spreads, and so things are cut off, like <laughs> the headers are often cut off halfway through the page. You have to kind of look back and forth to see them, but that's no problem. Um, you get monsters, and there's some really interesting kinds of monsters here. Um, Fool's Fire are really cool. These insects that... They kind of swarm together and they spread webs together and catch people in them. It's a really cool idea. And then also, this is really cool, that there's a sort of collection of all the monsters from the first edition. Because the monsters in the first book were not put together into one section. They were spread throughout the book, throughout the adventures. So here's where you can just see the page number where they are. Now, one thing you'll see is that not every creature, in fact, most of the creatures, don't have art for them. Which is, you know, it's uh, understandable. It'd be cool to have it. The art that is in here is good. Um, but... It's just there's not a lot of it. You get good descriptions of the creatures, but you know, it'd be nice to have all of it. Um, the rock crab, I like that piece of art. It's pretty cool. I like the guy fishing. It's just funny to me. Now, in this one and the next one, you get a couple page comic strip that just gives you an indication of, I don't know, it follows a particular squad of adventurers through their, uh, through their adventures in the various regions or dealing with some of the things that you might see in the game. The Creer is this really interesting creature. Um, they're huge, uh, especially towards the end. They're these huge whales that sail through and just devour huge things. And especially as they're huge, the Kir Imago, then um, you can kind of actually like sail through it and it becomes kind of a dungeon. Or if you get swallowed by one, then you have to kind of make your way out. Um, pirates. Uh, and pirate encounters, so you have notable features of the pirates, the ship name that you're dealing with, and the crew composition. Uh, then you get astral ships, and so rules for ships, saving throws, and then the ballista and how, how they fire, and the anu, Anokai fire thrower. Anokai? Onakai? I don't know how to say it. <laughs> say it how you want. And then you get particular ship descriptions, uh, which is really cool. The catamarans, the kawakas, uh, titans, 
Red Hornet, the sloops. Cool piece of art there. A Tortuga, a psionic ship. And then you get some magic items. Coral Crusted Skull Cups, Astral Amphitur... Amphitur? Amphitury? I don't know how to say that. <laughs> I'm sure there's a special way to say that, or a way to say that people know. I don't know how to say it. Um, and then you get, after the magic item section, the Hex Flowers. So Hex Flowers are essentially a way of doing random encounters, weather encounters, um, movement through the Astral Sea in one system, but you kind of have to modify it depending on which one you're doing. So there's rules for how to run it. It's actually cool, and it gets the sense of using a hex grid for more than just movement. Um, but you do have to keep each of them in mind. They kind of roll differently. So to travel, you use a 2d6, um, and this is sort of the general way that uh, encounters happen. For weathers, you roll a d4 and a d8, and it's a slightly different thing. And then for traveling from plane, you roll a d12. And 1 through 6 moves you, but then 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 do something different. So it's an interesting system. You get encounters and, and things like that in the different regions. And then you actually get, yeah, the planes themselves, the astral sea, the elemental air. And so as you'll see, go back to this map here. Um, it's the, the, the planes are all divided up, but it's not like you're sailing through those planes. Rather, you're sailing over those planes. You can see them below you through the water. The, the Astral Sea covers all of this, essentially. And so as you go over these planes, the things will change. And then there are islands that are floating in the sea that connect to those planes below. That's kind of a cool way of doing it. Instead of like sailing through the plane of fire, you're sailing over the plane of fire. And so the Astral Sea takes on characteristics of the plane of fire. And there are portals down to it. Um, so you're kind of sailing, this is all just through the Astral Sea. So you're really not necessarily going to these different planes. You can, but there are islands that are associated with them that you're probably going to be more associated with, and you're probably going to be encountering them more. Um, so you get the elemental air, elemental earth, elemental fire, elemental water. And then you get Mors, which is the god of or the plane of death. Ordo, the plane of law and time. Phicor, which is the plane of life. Sonix or Sunix, which is the plane of light and truth, and Yind, which is the plane of darkness and lies. And then you get uh, a breakdown of the hunter beneath the waves, which is these uh, these Kir Imagos, which are these giant whales, essentially leviathans that swallow whole ships. And if a big one does manage to swallow you, you get a new a kind of a new dungeon hex flower within this creature. Here's what you have. You have a, a way of trying to navigate through it and the different zones that you have to go through and what might be in them. Room descriptions that you have to roll up and then optional tables. So you get NPCs you can find on there, traps, the cavity shape and size that you're in, as well as notable features of that area. So the temperature, the smell, taste, things that you might find there, the noise, surfaces, air currents, psychic effects, and light. And then you get adventure hooks. The faceless one, map hunting, the great pirate regatta, and the prisoner. And that's it for this book. Uh, except at the very end, you get astral fishing. And what happens if you go fishing in the astral sea? Because why wouldn't you? Why do you seek adventure? Is it for riches, fame, or the thrill? All this and more can be found on the astral sea. But what weird dangers lurk below the psychic waters? Are the rewards truly worth the risk? Great back cover for this one. So as you guys can see, this one's much broader than the first one. It covers how to sail through the Astral Sea, indications of the sorts of places you can go, lots of random tables, lots of hooks and adventures you can do, lots more creatures, ships, and it's just a great supplement to the first book, but actually this is kind of, I would have expected this to be book one, really. <laughs> but I guess the book, first book should be more of an adventure location and site, and I guess in that sense the first book is more of, a, of an introduction to the setting, but you really do want to kind of combine them. Now the third one is much more focused. Planar Compass Issue 3 is about the Plane of Ord and the islands that are associated with it. So it's a specific part of the Astral Sea. So you could use this on its own, just kind of the way you could use the first one on its own. Or you could, uh, you know, kind of play the others without this. You don't necessarily need this one. Now, I think it's a really good issue. It's a really good book. It's also 72 pages, so it's, it's as large as the second one. And it has a lot of great ideas, adventure hooks, and locations. Um, but it's, it's just a particular setting, basically, within the Astral Sea. How to tell time? <laughs> There's 21 apertures. Time is divided into these 21 apertures. Um, you have an index of monsters in this book. And what this what this book includes. It includes some new character classes, the Chanicoids and the Time Priests, if you want to play a, uh, a human 
uh, priest of the god of time, Ordo. Well, or Ordo's dead, but sort of he can still serve his will, sort of, or its will. Um, and then there's a priest, time priest spell list, which are actually really cool. I think a time priest would be a really fun class to play. An introduction to the whole setting, and then particular locations. You get the clockwork port and the cathedral there, which is one of the major locations, kind of a dungeon there. Although I don't know if you'd want to fight your way through it, but it's certainly a location you can, you can encounter. And it's laid out like a dungeon. And then you get Ordo itself, the plane of law and time, as well as the great wheel which floats above it. And then below it is the kingdom of Rytus Divinus. And then there's the time well, which is a kind of dungeon there. And then at the very end, they have rules for clockwork beetle jousting. It's <laughs> one of the pastimes in the uh, in the plane of Ord. A general introduction to the place. There's two meanings to the to the word Ordo. There's the plane and the god. There's two parts to this book. And then there is... It's all very ordered. <laughs> it's all very ordered, as you might expect from a book about order. Two classes, two roads. Everything is laid out in twos here. Um, there's Chanakoid and how you play them and the restrictions from playing them. And they're very interesting. You can figure them differently. There's acolytes, in soldiers, and infiltrators. So it's sort of almost three classes in one. Um, and then you get the time priest, which has you know regular OSE rules for it. Now, if you don't play OSE, you could easily... I, I'm not sure easily adapt this, but uh, if you do play OSE, it's a really cool class. And the spells, I think, are really, really awesome. Um, there are laws of time preservation. So if you're a priest, you have to follow these laws. And then you get the laws themselves, or the, the, the spells themselves, I should say. And they're really cool. Accelerate healing, calcify good memories or calcify bad memories, detect chaos, future friction, mend, no time, uh, erode, mask, age, no alignment, hold person, nostalgia, Ordo's task, or the ward of Ordo, the field of law, ignore malady, locate object. Great, as you might expect, a priest of time to be able to, to do great things that a priest of time would be able to do. Summon past self. Dispel chaos. Foresight, moving in sync. And then fifth level spells, which are quite, quite strong here. Stop time. Temporal distortion, temporal stasis. And then you have referee introductions. This, this issue is intended for little characters level four to seven, so it's a bit higher. Um, you get certain locations and different two, two locations and two factions, once again, two um, divided here. The clockwork port itself with the different secrets here. This is an image of the clockwork port, very ordered, very orderly. Uh, in the center is the divine gate, which connects to the plane itself. Different locations with rumors and quests there and secrets that you might find in this place. Great breakdown of the location with some really good art that shows you what you're looking at. You can either show it to your players or describe it. But I think it's really cool. The cathedral itself. And uh, great art. I really like the, the dungeon art in this one. Actually, I should have mentioned that too. In the first uh, adventure, in Planar Compass 1, the dungeon art was really cool because it's basically top-down, but it's actually very slightly isometric. And so you get a sense of doors and things are actually written on the doors, like secrets or traps. Um, it can be hard to see at first, but if you, if you look close in the first one, you can see it. I don't think there are any trap doors here or secret doors here, but... Um, I just really like this style of, of map design, map drawing. It's really cool. Well, there is a secret stairway to the jail, I suppose. Different locations, clockwork, gargoyles, and just a generally really cool location. Again, I don't know if you'd necessarily fight your way in. I suppose you could, but it might be pretty difficult. And uh, the, the consequences for fighting the Cathedral of Ord in, on the island of Ord, right above the plain of Ord, is probably pretty significant. A portal to Gnosis, which is the plane of Gnosis. Um, and then there are people down here, part of a heretical sect called the Redeemers, who want to turn back time, which is obviously anathema to the Church of Time. Ordo, the plane of law and time. And you have the spokes of the Great Wheel and the place itself. There's the Dunes of Enlightenment, there's a Time Herrick down there, the Sea of Salvation, various locations in the, I like this piece of art, but various locations in the plane itself. And then you have the Great Wheel, which is the holiest site in the Orden religion and the center of Chanakoid society. You have the Night Rotors, and you have 21 hanging towers named after the 21 chimes or 21 apertures in the time of the universe. And that's what it looks like, this really cool floating city or floating temple, floating holy site uh, above the desert with the old kingdom below. 
of the feudal society of the Chanakoys. And it's really quickly broken down. You can see very clearly the, uh, the different uh, districts and the colors. And number eight is my favorite, the Jousting Arena, where you joust on giant beetles. Uh, different locations and things here. Here's one another one of these comics, which I think is pretty cool. You get the time well itself, and then the very that's sort of a prison. You, you basically, they trap people in this prison where time is dilated, so that the prisoners take a lot longer, right? So the faithless they're trapped in a place where the the time passes at one fifth the speed of Ordo as a whole. So it's really bad, right? Um, and there's different levels. So if you were, for example, if you if your players end up doing something bad, they might end up in the time well. And at the very bottom, there's the accursed pit where time stands still. And there's a prisoner there who relates to the secret of the entire place. A traitor. And then at the very end, as I said, clockwork beetle jousts. Um, with the giant clockwork beetle stats and different NPC knights, as well as the procedure and the prize. Great piece of art there at the end. So I think this is a great setting. The third book is, is really good. I really like Ord, and I imagine they're going to be releasing books like this in future, right? So this one uh, is details one of these planes, but I imagine you'll have one for the plane of death, and one for the plane of life, and one for the plane of uh, secrets and chaos, and one for the plane of light, and one for the plane of fire, earth, air, water. They might do all of the elementals in one, or something like that. I don't know the plan, but I think it's, you know, I'm sure you could easily do that and expand out different locations, even in the Astral Sea itself. So this is a, a setting and a series that is ripe for additional issues. So I'd recommend this one. I think you can get the bundle right now for pretty cheap. It's like $14 maybe for all three of them together. I'll put a link below to where you can get them. I really recommend them. Planar Compass. Again, I, the more I look through them, the more I kind of want to run them, which is often the way with me. But I don't think I will, at least not immediately. They are really primed for old school essentials. And you could obviously adapt them fairly easily. But I have too much that I want to run right now to probably put this on my on my like must playlist. But it's a good setting, and I think a lot of people it will appeal to a lot of people really, really uh, strongly. So here it is. If you know if you are one of those people to whom it appeals, go check it out. Um, I'll put links below. All right, guys. I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you in another video.